We always have to announce that now. It's something new that I didn't know before. Uh, I'm going to share screen at first uh, with you, uh, and I'm just going to get, show you some of the covers of the books, uh, my books that I'm going to discuss today. And just to give you a little bit of a visual. Uh, and this uh, is my first book that I published, the Ukrainian translations, uh, Selected Poetry of Lina Kostenko, Wanderings of the Heart. It uh, was with a very big publisher in New York City that had a series of world uh, poets in translation. Uh, and the Garland Publishers was the publisher. Uh, uh, I also did a second book, a bilingual edition that I published in Ukraine when Nina Kostenko was uh, being promoted for a Nobel Prize at the time, and they wanted to have a second book of her poetry in translation. So I did the second book of her later poetry. Uh, this is a novel that uh, I translated that hopefully all of you are familiar with. It's a brilliant novel, in my opinion, one of the best novels written the last 50 or so years in Ukraine, uh, Pervarezi, a perversion uh, of Yuri Andropovich, with I uh, published with Northwestern University Press. Uh, actually, the author, uh, Yuri Andropovich, was just here for a visit for five days. Uh, well, do you all see this well enough? Let's see, or should I make it full screen? Oh, I can't hear you, Vasid, so. Vasid Mitrovich, turn on the mic. Vasid Mitrovich, turn on the mic, please. Sorry. So, I think that probably, if, if you wish, we can just uh, have it like this, just see how, how we may have Yeah, other... yeah if it's visible enough, uh, rather than make it full screen. Uh, yeah. So I, these are just, you know, to show you a few of the things that I've done here. Uh, and this is another bilingual edition that I live, I did in uh, with a Lviv publisher, and it's the poetry of Viktor Neborak, Litai Cholova, Tainchi Virshi, and uh, it's really complicated poetry to translate. And fortunately, Victor helped me out quite a bit in my translations. I translate a very wide variety of things, uh, and I have very, very wide interests, and they tend to go from Skovroda. I published the correspondence with Eleanor Adams. I also published many things the last 10 years with a co-translator, uh, usually a native speaker of Ukrainian, uh, because I found that very helpful in, in a couple of ways. I can work quicker uh, and get things, get more things out. And also the native speaker catches things. I didn't grow up in Ukraine. Uh, I didn't grow up uh, speaking literary Ukrainian. Uh, so I spoke Ukrainian a little bit at home with my parents. I never went to Ukrainian school or anything. So I am a bit of a, uh, the way you call it in Ukrainian, sama uk. Uh, so in terms of uh, Ukrainian language, uh, you know, through practice translating and then my trips to Ukraine, I've traveled quite a few times and had uh, three Fulbrights to Ukraine. Uh, and uh, I did this book because it had never been done before. And uh, Skovorda is a great Ukrainian philosopher and I wanted the world to have access uh, to his writings there to get people to write scholarly works about Skovorda. Uh, and I also did the Garden of Divine so Songs uh, and uh, this, uh, these covers of both of these Skovroda books are by Ukrainian artists from uh, Lutsk, uh, Mykola Kumanovsky. Uh, and this uh, particular cover he calls uh, Klenode. Uh, so, well, it's a whole series, Klenode Ukraine. And uh, this he did, uh, he calls it the DNA of Ukraine. Uh, in English translation, and uh, the different pisanke uh, are supposed to be souls of Ukrainians. The ones that are darker have had more life experiences and are closer to, to death, and the ones that are uh, lighter and, and brighter are, you know, fresher souls who are younger. Uh, I also did this 
uh, book with uh, Glagoslav publishers of the fantastic worlds of Yuri Vinichuk. I translate Vinichuk quite a bit. Uh, the big problem in translating him uh, is the complexity of trying to convey uh, Galician dialect. And uh, But I really enjoy uh, his writing style and uh, several of his things are, uh, if you haven't read them, Tango Smarki, uh, it's a must read uh, for all Ukrainians, brilliant brilliant work and uh there is a recent uh a recent publication uh i think this publisher in detroit published fantastic works of ukrainian authors and they took my translation of his vishivani sheet uh an embroidered world uh which i originally published in kenyan review which is a very prestigious uh university publication here in the united states and they use that <laughs> excuse me, in the title uh, of the of the book of fantastic works of Ukrainian authors. Uh, and uh, some of my more recent publications are this with Ala uh, Perminova. I published this uh, biography of Zelensky. Uh, it's not really a biography, but the publisher insisted on calling it a biography. It seems uh, from the rise and fall of Zelensky, how he rose to become president. And, and it also discusses all of the issues he had that had his, uh, uh, had his rating drop to as low as 30% the day before the invasion. Of course, after you know he led the fight against Russia, that's come back up. Uh, and I also most recently, whoops, sorry, I missed one here. Uh, this is a book that I did with Ala Perminova and Marko Andrejcik, uh, and these are nine Ukrainian authors, uh, essays about the war. This one is published by Penguin Books, uh, which is one of the five biggest publishers in the world. And the first edition sold out, uh, and it was in a print edition of 20,000 copies. And so it's already in its second edition. Uh, and as far as I know, that might be the most uh, most copies sold of any Ukrainian book. Uh, I have to look into that a little bit to make sure I'm not uh, telling you an untruth, but uh, in my opinion, I think that that is true. Uh, I also did uh, this uh, particular book, Konotopska uh, Vigma, and uh, I did that for Glagoslav publishers, and I did, uh, I did this one with Ala Perminova. And the big complexity in dealing with this is translating Old Church Slavic uh, because the uh, uh, Pistriak, the, the uh, Pesar, uh, speaks in Old Church Slavic, as does uh, a deacon, a diak in the, in the novel. And it's uh, really hard to understand and convey that. And I also did one other book here, and I'll talk about this just a little bit, but uh, the Ukrainian mentality, uh, which came out uh, with Ibidim publishers that has a whole series uh, of, of books on Ukraine. I think this was the 38th or 39th. Uh, it's a European publisher that has ties with Columbia University Press. Uh, the author is Alexander, uh, or all, in Ukraine, Alexander Strashny. And he's... Uh, has two lives in two locations. He lives in Kiev and he also lives in Budapest in Hungary. He's a practicing uh, psychiatrist. And uh, he did this ethno-psychological historical exploration uh, of uh, Ukrainian mentality. Uh, parts of the book are extremely clever. Uh, he does an interview with three historical figures. He creates an interview, including Hohol, Mikola Hohol, and interviews three, uh, de Beauplan and one other person uh, whom I forget off the top of my head, but he creates an interview with them and takes the answers from their writings, uh, you know, about Ukraine, about uh, Ukrainian Cossacks. Uh, and uh, it's a fascinating book, particularly the second half of it, and it gives some insight on what's the difference between Ukrainian mentality uh, from Russian mentality and how Ukrainian mentality fits with the other mentalities of Europe. Uh, so I did this one with uh, one of my former 
uh, graduate students, a master's student who got a doctorate at the University of Toronto and now teaches at Yale University, uh, Olha Titarenko. And uh, what I often do is I, people who have taken my translation seminar here at Penn State University, who've done master's degrees with me, I engage them to work with me on translations. And uh, many of them go on, this was Olya's idea to translate this book. Uh, right now, the latest thing I'm working on is a wonderful book of uh, contemporary Ukrainian folk tales. It's uh, called Kaske Babe Havresheche. Uh, it's an absolutely wonderful book. It won the Mikola Hochul Prize in 2021 as best book in the horror uh, tale genre. Uh, and it's named after uh, Mikola Hochul. So I'm having a lot of fun translating that book. So I'll stop the share there and uh, get to my talk here. Now, uh, my, the title of my talk is The Translator's Sensibility in Making Sense Out of Texts. It's become more common now for a translator to be included as not just a translator, but with some enlightened publishers as a co-author on listings of translations of books. To a great degree, this is analogous to reality and a long time in coming for the translator to receive some kind, receive some kind of greater recognition other than just a scrivener like uh, Hohoy's Akaki Akakievich. Uh, the work of translators has been perceived as an echo, uh, as something much less than that of a creative author. Uh, the names of translators in previous times often have never appeared on covers of books, and if they have, not on the cover, and only in small print at the bottom of title pages, or buried somewhere inside a book. Sometimes the actual translator's name has not even appeared anywhere in published books. Thus, Lawrence Venuti's coinage on the invisibly, invisibility of the translator is quite apt in historical terms. The apparent requisite for the translator to appear, for, uh, disappear from a work that she or he has translated, ceding virtually every word of the translation to the original author. That, however, is quite impossible because I do feel that translators become co-authors of a text, both in overt and in subtle ways. My discussion here will focus on the choices translators make and how that might influence both the translators and the reader's response to a text. The topic of my uh, discussion in part owes its origins to the writings of translation studies scholar uh, Ala Shirokova Mano, uh, also known as Perminova in many of her Ukrainian publications, uh, especially in her book, A Translator's Reception of Contemporary American Poetry. One might ask, how much of Goethe is Goethe in Ukrainian translations of him by Ukraine's most eminent translator, Bikola Lukash? And how much is the translator's vision and adaptation of him into Ukrainian? with Lukash's unique word choice and style, all shaped by his own sensibility. Lukash's textured translations, particularly of Boccaccio's Decameron and Cervantes' Don Quixote, while not meticulously faithful by design, had an extraordinary impact on a generation of Ukrainian writers. Uh, Yuri Andrukovich, Viktor Neborak, Ivan Malkovich, and many other of what I call Bubabu generation writers have discussed the translator's impact on their writing, both in print and in personal conversations with me. Lukash single-handedly expanded the vocabulary and stylistic possibility of Ukrainian literature in profound ways. Uh, Andrukovich recently has written about his admiration of Lukash in an article, Letters from and to the Sultan, that discusses Guillaume Apollinaire's poem based on the famous letter written to the Turkish Sultan by the Cossacks and Lukash's exquisite translation of it. In that article, Andrukovic writes the following about Lukash. Mikola Lukash is the saint of literary translation. There have been only a handful of people like him on the planet. He translated from 14 languages. He had an extremely expressive voice he wasn't a dull laborer of translation. 
He was a daring adventurer. His translations are incredibly alluring. You want to read them aloud to your friends. So Lukash's, and I might add Hrvori Kocher's, influence on a generation of Ukrainian writers is a marvelous indication of the incredible power of translation when done with craftsmanship and creativity. When the translator in the role of writer puts so much of his or her own, her own sensibility into a translation and virtually becomes a co-author in another language. Many Ukrainian writers have taken on the role of translators from the foreign languages they knew. Uh, Maxim Moreyski, Pavlo Tichina, and Yuri Androkovich, just to name a few of the more prominent ones. Their choice of what they translate is shaped by their own literary sensibilities. Androkovich, for example, sought out the more bombastic works of the beat writers for his translations and published the book of their works uh, in his translations from the 1950s and 1960s. Uh, the book was entitled Deng Smerki Pani Deng. Uh, it was published in 2006 by Folio Publishers in Kharkiv. And these beat writers like Jack Kerouac, Allen Ginsberg, Gregory Corso, and others of the beat writers and the New York School paved new paths in American literature. And Yuri and his generation endeavored to create new paths for a youthful Ukrainian literature that strove to overcome the doldrums of the effects of decades of the stodgy and oppressive demands of socialist realism, as well as a kind of delimiting patriotic national realism prevalent in the years just prior to Ukrainian independence. The Ukrainian writers of the 80s, as they're called in Ukraine, just as Nikola Khrilovy did in the 1920s, looked to the West for freer literary models and a decoupling from omnipresent oppressive Russian literary influence, as well as a chance to find and define their own path. Androkovich's sensibility as a translator captured the essence of the beats because they fit his own avant-garde sensibility and allowed his creativity to match it. Uh, Sofia Androkovich and Viktor Morozov's lively translation of Harry Potter and the Goblet of Fire succeeded because the translators approached their translation creatively and sought out humorous Ukrainian equivalents to the names of char characters such as uh, Chervochist, uh, Wormtail, which presented a subtly comic effect in translation similar to the original. A fusion of their excellent knowledge of English, collective talent, sensibility, and openness uh, to be creative guided them to make a better translation. Uh, I might add that the book is in its 32nd printing uh, with Ivan Malkovich's uh, Ababa Halamaha Publishers uh, in Kiev. So that's 32 uh, editions of that. Uh, as far as I know, that it, I may be a little bit behind on that. Now, in turning to my own work in translation, how much of my translation of Yuri Andropovich's perversion is Yuri, and how much of it is me? Uh, I can't say pre precisely because, thankfully, uh, that is up to you translation specialists and scholars to determine. While I think that most of it is him or a close version or a mild perversion, pun intended, uh, of him, a part of it definitely is me and my own evolving literary sensibilities that shaped my approach to the text. Prior to translating Andropovich and Viktor Neborak, my literary sensibilities were rather conservative. Uh, since I grew up in a highly patriotic Ukrainian emigre family uh, that focused on more traditionalist writers, such as Taras Shevchenko, Ivan Franko, and Lesha Ukrainka, uh, and also more contemporary ones who were notably praised in the emigration for their courage such as Lina Kostenko, Vasil Simonenko, and Vasil Stus. Exposure to Androkovich's innovative prose and Neborak's wildly experimental poetry, as well as to them personally, served to uh, change and expand my literary, ta literary taste exponentially. They influenced me to change my own perspectives and sensibilities to allow me to translate their innovative works. At least one reviewer of my translations of Androkovich has called me, quote unquote, controversial. I suppose the moniker was attempting to find creative solutions to Androkovich's multi-voiced experimental prose and perversion. I laughed when I read that 
and I'm happy to wear that crown for trying to find creative solutions in my translations. Uh, my translation of Andrkovich's novel, Perversion, was a true collaboration, both with Yuri and numerous other people who aided me in comprehending and conveying essential features of his extraordinary novel. Hundreds of emails back and forth to Yuri and numerous conversations about issues of translating his complicated text uh, when I met him in person, aided me considerably in conveying the sense and effects of the novel in English, whether that be humor, style, or wordplay. Our co-translation of uh, what uh, Yuri calls his Ode to Ada provides the best example. Uh, we sat down together in Yuri's apartment in Bullsburg, Pennsylvania, where he was living with his family during his 10-month Fulbright Fellowship to go over questions that had arisen in the text. My literal first draft translation of the poem didn't cut it for Yuri because he felt the English needed to be funnier and less stiff. He was absolutely right. So with a bottle of Zakarpatsky cognac on the table in an uh, apartment ironically owned by a guy by the name of Frank Karpate, uh, looking out on Tussie uh, Mountain, we began to brainstorm and co-create a new English version from the original which was a playful poetic meditation on the name Ada with various sound patternings. Yuri provided several of the rhymes and lines, particularly those with German language content, such as Jawohl Ada, Yaya Ada, and I others. Uh, Yuri uh, was a uh, kind of a, I think he was a major in Germanic languages and English uh, when he did his bachelor's degree uh, and originally was going to become a translator and not a writer. But in doing early translations that uh, generated his interest in writing and then he became the writer that he is today. Uh, I do recall when we were uh, going over this particular poem with him, I came up with the line, oh you ada my enchilada. Uh, and it just really rolls off the tongue in English, although it was very distant and semantic meaning from the original. Uh, Yuri, by the way, sings that in English on one of the CDs that he's made with the uh, group Carbido, and he sings it in English, and it goes over very well with audiences that know English. Uh, so despite the fact that we went over the entire poem in detail, last year, Yuri mentioned to me that we made one major mistake by his intended meaning of uh, Odin, uh, which uh, I translate as one, or it should have been Odin, uh, which I translated as one uh, or alone. I went back and forth between those two. Uh, but it should have been the Norse god Odin. Uh, besides the dictionary, the translator's best friend is a still living cooperative author such as Yuri or Victor Neborak, who both willingly participated in the process of co-translation by answering my myriad questions and explaining their creative processes to me. Uh, Bodan Boychuk, in his review in the journal Svitovid, Svitovid of my first book of Lina Kostenko's translations, noted that in some way my translations were, God forbid, my insertion of the last two words here, better than the original sometimes because they removed Kostenko's and Boychuk's uh, words, uh, boring uh, repetitions. Uh, many of Kostenko's early poems have song-like refrain, refrains that are quite acceptable to the Ukrainian reading public. My Kostenko translations are a version of the poet that I feel represents the essence of Kostenko in a poetic idiom that can be appreciated by a contemporary Anglophone reading public, which generally has an antipathy for repetitions in poetry, and by and large relegates them mostly to refrains in songs. Kostenko needs to be as natural, free, and flowing in English as she is in Ukrainian, without the constraints of rigid rhyme, meter, and other conventions that would be awkward to a contemporary Anglophone audience. I'm uh, always grateful when I see that a reviewer takes note of my method in translation when I do not explicitly explain it in my translator's introductions. For example, Oksana Yatskin, in her review of my translations of Maxim Rilski in the translation journal Metamorphoses, 
took the time to point out that I used internal rhymes, occasional rhymes, natural English syntax, and other methods to poeticize my English translations of the poet. The reviewer explained some aspects of my methodology, of which I was even unaware, because I primarily work intuitively for conveying what we might call my reiski, my English language reiski. Uh, that possessive my can be used virtually for every translation that all translators make, because they are engaging themselves as a filter and a sounding board to navigate two literary poly systems with their translations. Uh, one example of how a translator's sensibility influences their translation consists of many of the previous translations of Hohol's Taras Bulba. While a novel was written in Russian with a number of locu locutions in it in English, it focuses exclusively on Ukrainian culture. Unfortunately, virtually all previous translations were executed by ethnically Russian translators or Russianists with little or no understanding of Ukrainian history or culture from a Ukrainian perspective. One notable exception was John Kornos. Uh, his real name was Ivan Korshun, uh, who originally was from Zhytomyr and emigrated to the US and eventually Great Britain. Though even his translation mo uh, remains mostly a colonizing imperial one based on the time it was made in the early 20th century, to his credit, he presented the novel in his introduction largely on Ukrainian terms. So virtually all the translators of Taras Bulba have translated the 1842 revised pro-Russian, pro-Czar, pro-Russian orthodoxy version of the work and not the original, more authentically Ukraine-focused 1835 version. Olha Tetarenko and I have executed a translation of the 1835 version and restored the novel's uh, Ukrainian roots by using Ukrainian, uh, Ukrainian uh, uh, and uh, proper names, uh, place and proper names, and by providing notes that outline the Ukrainian historical context. Thus our own Ukrainian ethnicity, knowledge of the Ukrainian language and Ukrainian history, and our own sensibilities serve to decolonize the work in English uh, that hopefully will come be coming out uh, in the fall with uh, uh, Northwestern University Press. Now, uh, a translator's sensibility is reflected in the choice of works and authors that he or she translates. Few translators translate for money just because of the fact that they are woefully underpaid, if paid at all, and need to keep their day jobs. Uh, translators who are professors, such as Vitaly Chernetsky, uh, Marko Andrejcik, and I, have more time to do translations because our published works count as our scholarly output for our universities. I have been remunerated a few times, mostly from grants, the National Endowment for the Humanities, the Shevchenko <coughs> Scientific Society, and the Ukrainian uh, uh, Book Institute, and a few times by commercial publishers with a few thousand dollars to do translations. Uh, I mostly receive nothing but satisfaction and gratitude without monetary comp compensation for most of my translations. I also have turned down translation jobs because they round, ran counter to my own sensibilities. For example, I once rejected $15,000 to co-translate the memoirs of a former confidant of Viktor Yanukovych's. The thought of it was particularly od odious to me, so I refused to do it. Now, what draws us translators to it translation. There must be a connection with the author personally or a particular work for me to decide to do a translation. For me, it might be akin to falling in love with a work and finding a shared <clears throat> sensibility and connection with an author or text. Texts tend to choose me. I don't choose them per se. So it's a kind of courtship, a law of initial attraction that draws me aesthetically or emotionally. I fell in love with the novel Perversion the first time I read it, and I knew I had to translate it. The same happened with Lina Kostenko's poetry, with Attila Mohini's striking free verse, which I purchased for one ruble in 1993 in a Ukrainian bookstore in Lviv, uh, with the free-flowing voice of Oleg Ilchenko from Kiev, 
with Maxim Reisky's style and imagery and so forth. I also translate works for the cause. I've done a number of translations of essays and poems on the Ukrainian war in the past two years, and with Ale Permilova co-translated Zelensky, a biography uh, for Polity Books to acquaint the Anglophone world with the Ukrainian president. Uh, with Ol Olha Tetarenko, I co-translated co Alexander Strashny's The Ukrainian Mentality for Ibidem Books, which I felt was an important work for people to read to come to a better understanding of Ukraine and its people. I found that my literary tastes run the gamut from classic works to the avant-garde. I have as deep of a connection with Skovoroda and Shevchenko as I do with contemporary authors. Now, the idea of translating Grigori Kvitka Osnovyanenko's The Witch of Konotop came to me uh, after Glagoslav publishers contacted me about applying for a grant from the Ukrainian Book Institute to publish a translation with them. I should add uh, that it is marvelous that the Institute supports translators and publishers of Ukrainian literary works. Uh, that's something I suggested uh, long ago uh, in an op-ed piece that I wrote for the Kiev Post. Uh, and fortunately, most of my suggestions in that uh, op-ed piece have come to uh, be reality in Ukraine. Now, Ala Perminova and I ended up choosing the Witch of Konotop for a number of reasons. First of all, to my surprise, it had never been translated into English. Uh, it was a Ukrainian classic that definitely needed to be translated. It was being read by nearly everyone in Ukraine so it was, since it was part of the school curriculum. And my good friend, uh, the writer Bodan Zoldak, had written a play and film script based on the book. And I felt it was brief enough to be translated and the time allotted for the grant. It turned out to be both a delight and vexation to translate. Uh, so the primary task for us was to convey and differentiate the various linguistic levels of the character's speech. The scribe Pistriak and the local deacon often speak and write in Old Church Slavonic, the written bookish language of the church meant for performing the liturgy uh, and, and not to be spoken. Uh, while the Kozak captain Zabrocha speaks largely in highly colloquial, often harried Ukrainian, particularly when particularly when interacting with Pistria, who exasperates him. Uh, that's uh, the essence of the lot of the humor of the novel. Our solution was to convey the archaic speech in the novel in pseudo Elizabethan English, and at times in the language of the King James Version of the English Bible. Preciseness of meaning was not as important as providing linguistic texture and the polyphony of voices extant in the work. We tried our best to convey the humor of the novella, which was both verbal and situational. Zabrocha and Pistriak are petty men who both deserve each other's mutually irritating company and the comeuppance they receive uh, at the end of the novel. The Witch of Konotop, just like many other of Kvitka, Kvitka Osnovyanenko's work, is moralistic and didactic at its core. Greed, acquisition, and desire lead to self-destruction. You can find the same message throughout all of Nikola Hohu's writing. Uh, the narrative style of The Witch of Konotop also reminds me considerably of Nikola Hohu's best works from the same period, with a rambling folksy uh, Ska's narrator, uh, attention to insignificant detail, ironic asides, paradigmatic loser characters, and failed attempts at romantic encounters with the opposite sex. We also translated Kvitka Osnovyanenko's novella Tumbleweed to provide a sample of his more overtly moralistic writing. Thus, we hope that the availability of our translation leads to comparative study with Hoho's prose and allows the Witch of Konotop to make its way into the reading list of courses on 19th century Slavic literature. The novel also signals the high level of literary development of Ukrainian prose in an author of the early 19th century and smashes czarist Russia's stereotype of Ukrainians as illiterate peasants. Our sensibilities, uh, the translator and I, uh, co-translator and I, uh, Ala Permianova, and sensitivities to the original text allowed us to be open to creative solutions of an extraordinarily difficult text. 
Now, constraints of time limit my discussion of the translator's sensibility and how that influences how he or she makes sense out of text in a target language that almost always has a different sensibility. The translator must be aware of both sensibilities and balance them in his or her translation. The more sensitivity to what an author is doing in original text, the more a translator can convey that texture, whether it be varied, uh, varied speech patterns of characters, wordplay, style, vocabulary, or myriad other nuances. And so that's uh, all I had to say uh, at the moment. And uh, I can open things up to questions if anyone has questions. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Michael Isiso, for this second brief, but very, uh, but, but very nice uh, and very good uh, speech you see about translation. I think that it is due to the brilliant academic background uh, Professor Michael has because he graduated from American University, Washington, D.C. He studied in Columbia University, uh, uh, Harvard University, and uh, he worked at Rogers and many other prominent universities, so he's got a very good background. When he, say that, uh, when he said that he, uh, he, he is Samouk, you see, or something like that in Ukrainian, I think that he knows and he feels and he senses these subtleties of the Ukrainian uh, language very, very well. And uh, probably his colleagues and his authors, uh, his friends, authors, I mean, uh, like Yuri Andrukovich, they help him in understanding some subtleties too. But uh, I think that this, uh, this uh, speech of this, uh, this question that you have raise, raised here, um, also a very very important because of different reasons you mentioned that we a translator is a co-author you mentioned that uh, the uh, a translator it should have should have some sensibility should understand this uh, should know how to translate humor wordplay style and so on and so forth but i think that you have raised also the problem uh, the problems of translation and ideology translation and ethics. Some other problems are also here. Uh, my question is simply, you see, how, uh, or can you give any examples of translation? So let's say like wet play, like humor. And besides, as far as I know, you are a good translator also of poetry. And you mentioned also Lina Kostenko, but she is not the only, po the only one poetess you see here. You, you translated some other authors like Paolo Tichina, Maxim Rilski, and so on and so forth. So what how do how do you cope, you see, with wet play, translation of wet plays, or some humor? You mentioned situational humor sometimes or something like that. So I think that this is quite a challenge just for the for the translator, don't you think? Well, yeah, word play is one of the hardest things to to do because you simply can't uh, you know, you can't translate it. Well, I can give an example from Hohen uh, and the word Bogoslov and Bok Aslov. And so, uh, and that's wordplay that you find in, in Hohen. And uh, well, part of my project, by the way, is to reclaim Hohen for Ukrainian culture uh, because uh, Russia tries to exclusively keep in, in the Russian camp. Uh, with uh, you know uh, a lot of things that they do, they they for example, uh, I have an article that I, I wrote a while back called uh, "When You Google Google, You Never Get Hohol," and uh, it describes in detail how they appropriate uh, Hohol and uh, on the internet, uh, and it's kind of a funny thing because they used to call him. Uh, uh, in Russian, Ukrainsky pisaki Kotori pisal paruski. And now they call him Ruski pisaki. He's only a Ruski pisaki. But originally in the 1830s, Belinsky and other critics called him a Ukrainian uh, writer. But the word play is the hardest thing. And, and that was a very difficult thing in Andrukovich's uh, perversion uh, because he has a lot of it. Uh, and, you know, you can't. You can't find an equivalent 
all the time. Uh, and sometimes you have to just make a footnote and explain, look, this is what's happening in the text. It, there truly are things that are uh, untranslatable. Uh, but uh, the wordplay is, is one of the hardest things. Style is easily translatable. Humor in general uh, can be translated uh, fairly well. Uh, it, but the verbal humor, boy, that's, uh, it is a very difficult thing. And uh, I, I remember uh, Svetlana Bujak Jones and I translated the poetry of Bodan Rupchak. And uh, he had a poem where uh, you know, we discovered that what he did was he was dividing uh, words across two lines. Like he would have half a word at the end of one line and on the next line, the end of the word. But you could also read both of those words as separate words. Uh, and so th it, it was very clever, but it led to two different, uh, two different interpretations of the poem. And which do you translate? Uh, and we ended up kind of giving both versions. We translated it one way, but then we said, well, these lines can alternatively be read this way. And it was, uh, you know, we ultimately decided that it was actually a poem about uh, a sexual encounter, uh, uh, most likely with his uh, his wife Mariana, and um, and well, actually Mariana told me that you know when I showed her this is what the he says in this poem, and she said, "Oh, that's me," and uh, so, uh, but uh, you know, this being able to read things two ways, and I remember when I was uh, translating Nina Kostenko. I asked her, and I forget the word, the specific word, but I asked her, what do you mean by this word here in your poem? Because I came, I came up with five possible readings. You could read that word five different ways. And I wanted to ask the author, well, what, you know, what do you really mean? Because I wanted to convey what was closest to her. And uh, her answer was, uh, <laughs> so uh, what are you going to do? Uh, but, you know, she is the queen of Ukrainian poetry, a wonderful poet. Uh, and, you know, she had every right to say that. And I am the, pe I am the translator, so I have to do, uh, figure out uh, what's in there. So I did translate it one way, and then I put in a footnote saying, well, you can also read it this way. Uh, but, you know, I really like... Uh, these difficult things to translate because I like a challenge. If something is really easy to translate it, why bother? You know, you can you just, you know, you can deep L translate something and, you know, clean it up a little bit. Uh, but I prefer things that are uh, Antonich. Antonich is extremely difficult. Uh, and particularly because his syntax, he uses very uh, disjunctive syntax. Uh, and and you read some of the lines and you have to kind of put the grammar under a microscope to figure out, you know, what he really means uh, to find the meaning of that line. But then again, you oftentimes can read the line two different ways because you can have two different subjects uh, in a line of his, uh, you know, particularly if it's a masculine inanimate, uh, you know, in the accusative case. So... The courses I took with, uh, you know, uh, Yuri Shevelyov, uh, you know, in the structure, you know, of, of I took courses with him in the structure of Ukrainian. And well, I, you know, that I should say I'm not a, a, a Sama Uk completely. I took uh, the structure of Ukrainian and Belarusian with uh, Yuri Shevelyov, and I took a, a Ukrainian poetry of the 1920s class with Amri Ronan. Uh, who was teaching in the summer session at Harvard University. Uh, but Antonich, uh, and I'm doing a complete works edition of Antonich right now, uh, there's a tremendous interest now in all things Ukrainian. Uh, uh, Putin wanted to destroy Ukrainian culture, uh, make it invisible. And what's happened is the whole world wants to now see and hear Ukrainian culture. 
Uh, we have local musicians who are going to be doing a, a concert of uh, purely Ukrainian repertoire. Uh, and that's going to be happening on uh, June 4th. Svetlana Bujak Jones is uh, helping to organize that. These are all American musicians who had never heard a note of Ukrainian music before. And they have this incredible interest in it. Uh, uh, publishers uh, contacted uh, Marko Andrejcik to do that volume uh, for him of the Ukrainian authors responding to the war. Uh, and uh, I get requests all the time. Uh, I have like 10 or 15 requests to do translations for people. Uh, now, right now I mentioned that one project and I'm also doing Shevchenko's diaries. Shevchenko's diaries uh, have never appeared in English translation before. Uh, and I thought that was really crazy. You know, such an you know, incredibly important figure, uh, well known throughout the world. Uh, there are more monuments of Shevchenko than any other personage in the world now. Now that all the uh, Lenin, Vladimir Ilyich, Lenin statues have been knocked down, uh, you know, outside of Russia, uh, now Shevchenko is number one in terms of statues of a person, uh, you know, throughout the world. But yeah, the, that uh, wordplay is is sometimes the hardest. Long answer to uh, your question, so. Thank, thank you, thank you, thank you. One more quick question only, you see. So I am just asking you as a translator. So first of all, I'm grateful that you uh, acquainted me with uh, Vitaly Chernetsky, Mark Andrejcik, so I can say that, well, I met these people too, I know, just your surrounding. But the question is, as a translator, so you use the word uh, translator sensibility, and how would you translate sensibility in Ukrainian? You see, because we understood just the essence of what it is, you see, but how to translate it into Ukrainian, the very oh. word, you see. Well, you see, uh, that's your problem because you are the translator. You're translating, <laughs> I, I thought that. <laughs> no, but uh, that's a hard one. And, you know, nothing comes to mind that would encapsulate the entire, the sensibility is your, it's a combination of your sensitivity and understanding, but also perception, perception, probably. And it's that it's many different things. It's your, it's your background. Uh, like, for example, if someone is particularly religious, uh, that background in them is going to influence how they translate uh, words or which texts they translate. Because certain authors who use crude language would not work for, you know, somebody who is opposed to using crude language. Uh, I feel like I'm a very open to, I, I'm, I've translated religious texts, you know, in the Skovoroda. Uh, I grew up in a, uh, you know, Greek Catholic family. So I went to church my entire life, very familiar with the divine liturgy. I translated Skovoroda's book of religious verse. Uh, uh, so, but that, yeah, that's the problem. The the word encapsulate encapsulates many different things, and what what I mean by it here is uh, sensibility is the way you look at a text based on your own you know your own education, your own not knowledge, your own morals, and uh, you know, and in that sense of uh, you know if you're open to doing wild and crazy texts and translating, then you have that uh, same sensibility. Like Andrew Kovac's sensibility, he was a very bombastic uh, boo ba boo, uh, you know, doing performance uh, performances, using bad language. So what did he seek out? He, he sought out uh, similar writers uh, in the West. Uh, so that sensibility that was uh, inside. Andrukovich is also a, a great Ukrainian patriot, an incredible patriot. And uh, uh, he, he uh, loves the poetry of Lina Kostenko. He, uh, he, somebody once criticized him for something and uh, uh, he said, well, why doesn't he honor Lina Kostenko more? And he, he responded in his interview, I love Lina Kostenko's work, particularly her poem Van Gogh, uh, and, uh, which is a masterpiece a masterpiece. The, the final lines of it are untranslatable. It's, uh, she says, Bože Vilni, Bože Ja Vilni. Oh, 
Good luck. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you. Probably th there are awesome. I, I, I know that you are in the REC. Probably some other people have some questions. Welcome, please. Because yes, I don't there, want there's to. There's a Mariana who wants to ask a question. Yes, yes. I have to ask based on your experience, what is more important, preserving the initial idea of the original author's, I guess, language and the audience that it was intended for, or adapting the text for the target audience? Well, you know, that's a tough question. And I, what I've said about that is it's a balancing act. It depends. And we're, we're undergoing this uh, issue in my translation of Ole Havrish's uh, Kaske Babe uh, Havrishche, because the names of the characters are funny. And do you translate the humor by going with... Uh, Look, if a character's name is Chornakata, do you use the word Chornakata? Or do you say Black Hat or, or Black House? Uh, by saying Black House, you take away the Ukrainianness of the original. Uh, I sometimes, uh, like, uh, for example, in Androkovich's perversion, I had to make there's a called the we call it the naming scene, and Stach Perfetsky has forty different names, and you know if you just convey the names in transliteration, it really doesn't do anything for the reader in English. So we translated them uh, in a funny way, so kind of conveying the funniness of the original. Uh, for example, uh, I remember Karp Loverboyski. Uh, so I use that ski ending, which is common for Slavic. And uh, so um, uh, so you really have to kind of decide, uh, do you want to pay more deference to your audience in English, make it easier for them to read? Or do you want to take a middle road, which is kind of what I take? Uh, or do you want to just keep things in transliteration and then footnotes? or endnote uh, the particular thing. And it kind of depends. Um, Sofia Androkovich and uh, Viktor Morozov in their translations of Harry Potter uh, are creative sometimes, but sometimes they just use the names. Uh, Dumbledore is Dumbledore. Uh, I don't know how much that means to, you know, somebody just reading it in Ukrainian, but uh, Cervochis, that's great. They were able to calc the different parts of it and make it very funny in uh, Ukrainian. So again, you have to balance things out and decide. Uh, sometimes editors and publishers decide those for you because they want something. Uh, they want it a particular way. They may want it more readable. Uh, I, I remember I was once, uh, my translation of Guzik uh, that I did with Olya Tetarenko, the the reviewer wrote, this sounds like a translation. Well, it is a translation, and that's why it sounds like a translation. And the reviewer complained that I gave too many footnotes. Well, the problem is that Americans or, you know, other readers of English who read this aren't going to know this, you know, Soviet context. So, and if you don't want to read the footnotes or endnotes, don't read them. Don't look at them. Don't let it bother you. They're not meant for that particular reader who knows the Ukrainian context. This is one of the reasons, by the way, why I, I, I never do reviews of translate translations, of other translations. I can pick up any translation and I will find a mistake on any random page I open it up to. And I will find things that could be said in a better way than the translator did. But I shouldn't be deciding that because I'm not the person who's going to read it in English. I'm going to read it in Ukrainian. Uh, and uh, so that, you know, that's another issue. But it's a good question. And thank you. you. Know. Thank you for your response. Yeah. So we have Nick Nick Prokhorov. Yes, uh, I just wanna uh, want to ask um, uh, how uh, how we 
how person can become such translator as you? Uh, whom uh, whom should we address? Like publishers, uh, some authors, or uh, where where can I find such a job to translate to well, practice? Uh it's uh, what you have to do initially is to uh, build up a resume and you have to start uh, publishing usually smaller works, smaller prose pieces, and it depends what you want to translate. Uh, I mean, my uh, favorite Ukrainian translator, actually she's translating uh, a novel that I wrote a couple of years ago called uh, uh, Eight, uh, the Eighth Sign of the Lion, Voshmi Znak Leva, which is a sequel and um, to my Seven Signs of the Lion that Mariana translated. Uh, Mariana is, in my opinion, the best Ukrainian translator of works. Uh, one thing is to get advice from people like uh, Mariana uh, uh, Prokopovich, uh, get to know them. Uh, uh, you know, go to workshops. They now have workshops. Uh, my good friend, uh, she's also a poet, uh, but she's also a, a professor uh, at uh, Catholic University of Lviv, uh, Maria Tetarenko. She has a, a creative writing seminar that she runs. Uh, and, you know, in creative writing seminars, that's they're not very common in Ukraine. But we have translation seminars uh, that are very common. We have translation uh, programs like at the University of Iowa that are well known and all of those things. So you want to start working, translating a few things, sometimes just poetry, publish thing in Ukrainian journals, build up a resume. And then, you know, so you get your name out there. I mean, that's how I started. I started publishing in a couple journals. Uh, there are many more, thank God, there are many more translators of Ukrainian literature into English now. Uh, back in the day, there were maybe three or four of us and uh, when I was starting up. And now probably at least 30 uh, who were pretty well known. Uh, but, you know, start up, build a resume, publish things, publish things on the uh, internet. And then when you apply to do a larger book, you know, you also have to get permissions if it's something that is in copyright uh, from an author. And uh, and I mean, that's the main thing. And Ukrainian publishers are not uh, particularly easy. It's very hard to, to do something with Ivan Malkovich. Uh, uh, my author, Oleg Havrish, sent out his manuscript to 64 Ukrainian publishers. Two of them responded. Uh, and he did publish it with one of them. Uh, but uh, so it's not an easy task. You have to also be willing to accept rejections uh, and also to show your translations to other people because other people will see things that you don't see. Uh, and of course, you, you need to know the language extremely well from which you're translating. Uh, so, you know, that's important too. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you. Any other questions so far? Because it seems to me the time is up. I do have like five minutes, so that would be okay. Fine. So, more questions, please. Here, all okay, I've got one. Yes, Mr. Naiden. Uh, so, could you please share your viewpoint on the idea that translators should uh, translate into their native language rather than in the reverse direction like do you support this viewpoint or not oh yes yes i would never i would never translate things into ukrainian i mean i i have done it on a personal level uh for example i i've written uh someone locally had to give a speech in ukraine and so i did the first draft of it but i sent it to one of my native speaker friends svilana bujak jones uh, or to Allah. Ala Perminova was from, both of them from Chernivchi, by the way, if you didn't know that. And mm -hmm. uh, and both of them, uh, you know, were at the university there. And uh, I would never do it. And I always would ask somebody because the, the native speaker has the nuances. I know I had a 
translation studies major from Lviv study with me and he had his master, got his master's degree with us. And he would ask me whether he needed to use the or uh, he's, and I would correct his does, uh, you know, his articles. And I tell him, no, you can't use a the here. And, and that can't be, the rules say it should be a the. And I tell him, well, I'm sorry, no. And he, he asked me, well, explain why. And I, I can't explain why. I only, I mean, I was born into, you know, the United States, grew up speaking English, spoke Ukrainian at home with my parents, but I just knew and I intuitively know and, and we don't know. Whereas, you know, somebody is Ukrainian and even if you are doing a translation in Ukraine, it's very good to get, uh, you know, an editor look it over and somebody else look it over because they will catch things. Uh, so, but yes, I completely agree. Only translate into your native language. Thank you. There's a funny thing happening, and uh, she may be giving you a, a lecture too, uh, Allah. Uh, well, now she's Allah Shirokova Mano, uh, and she has learned Spanish at a very high level. And she has been forced at the University of Barcelona to teach a course of translation into Spanish, which is a, a very weird thing. Now, she's extremely uh, capable and really brilliant, uh, but it's really hard for her to teach that course because, you know, she's a native speaker of uh, Ukrainian, a uh, native speaker of Russian, and she knows uh, she knows English at a really high level. So all of that, uh, but I don't, I don't think she would translate anything into Spanish. She would feel uncomfortable doing it. We had, we had Alla Shurakavamana, you see, the other day she spoke, you see, on some issues of how to, how translation studies are taught and studied in, in Spain. In Barcelona, in Catalonia, actually. So sure. she made a speech, and we had an opportunity to 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 discuss the, all the issues concerning translation with her as well. Thank you. You see, so actually, so, so these are the people as Svetlana Bujak Jones, as you mentioned, and Allah. So they are from our university, and you and should be very proud of them. Um, They're both great. Yeah. Uh, Fortunately, we'll have to, let's see, what time is it? Oh, so okay. I time for one more question. So I see well, there, yeah, there's Maxim. Yeah. Hi. Uh, so I'll try to make it quick. Uh, basically, we were speaking about book translations. Yeah, but my question is more about cinematography. So uh, Zelensky offered to reduce the number of uh, Ukrainian dub movies in cinemas. So by the end of, like, by 2030, it's supposed to be like... Uh, about 80% of uh, original movies and about 20% of Ukrainian dub movies. So what's your opinion about this stuff? Well, I think it's a bad thing. And uh, what's your opinion about Ukrainian dub in general? A Ukrainian, I'm sorry to miss the one word. Uh, Ukrainian translation of the movies and stuff. You know, that's a whole different, as they say in English, ball of wax. Because, you know, you cannot translate every utterance uh, when you're doing a translation, uh, where you're doing the subtitles of a movie. It'll be very curious to me when Solotka Darusha comes out, because they're using my translation, English translation, for the subtitles. But you can't fit it all in the screen because people can't, and you have to compact things more. So, you know, I don't know. I, I, I would be critical of things I think, but I understand the problem because you can't translate every utterance because you simply do not have the time on the screen, you know, to put up everything. So things tend to get shortened. Things tend to get left out. Uh, there are mistakes. I've seen lots of mistakes uh, in uh, things I've seen, uh, particularly watching them on YouTube when there are, you know, subtitles. But I mean, that happens. Uh, Look, the one thing all translators are fearful of is making the big mistake. 
something that's really totally stupid. And uh, that happened once by a scholar and I wrote a review of her book and it was a book on Marina Tsvetaeva and I happened to have two books of translations of hers that I did. Uh, I, by the way, I do, do not do uh, translations of Russian anymore uh, you know, since the war happened. Uh, I, I actually have only translated one thing in Russian but it's an anti-Putin play uh, that I translated into English uh, and that we're trying to get uh, turned into a movie. But the, the person made a big mistake in her translation. And it, it, it was really an awful mistake that, uh, and the line was, Istich spor shelesti. And uh, she translated it as, and the, uh, the argument of poetry quieted. And I can't believe she made that mistake and she built a whole chapter of her book on that. And, and she didn't realize that stich was the past tense. Uh, so the, the argument quieted. The man and woman in this particular poem uh, had an argument and they went to bed and the, uh, 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 so I had to point out that her entire chapter was wrong based on her mistranslation. Uh, she has never spoken to me ever since, but I'm sorry, I had to say something. I, I praised the rest of her book, but that's, you know, couldn't pass. So. Michael, uh, thank you very much for this speech in the exciting and this discussion, which, uh, uh, which that speech caused, you see, so I think, thank you very much. So we really feel that we badly need you in Chernivtsi, in peaceful oh, Chernivtsi and peaceful Ukraine. You know, the so first I chance I get, I will be visiting. And I miss all of you. And I love Chernivtsi. Uh, I love visiting there. And uh, it's my, my home city, thanks to to you and my all my friends there. So. Thank you very much. So hope that you will give us the link of the recording. Yes. Yes. Later on, you see. So and as far as other links. And so far, we thank you. We know that you are too busy, and we are grateful that you have found some time for us to see, just to speak about translation, about your legacy, and about simply how to do good translations. And you are setting an example. Yeah, there need to be more translation workshops in Ukraine because uh, workshopping and courses in translating uh, and uh, translation studies departments tend to study translations and not do as much translation, uh, but it's practice makes perfect. And I also thank the comments that uh, people left here uh, uh, in the... Uh, in the uh, chat. So thank you both for leaving those comments. So, and thank you for being such a- and Thank you for being party. with us. Yes. Thank you for being with us, you see, all the time and, says, and and sharing with your wonderful ideas, usually at the eyes, you are very well. Interesting thank and precious. Slava Ukraini. Okay, bye. So, Bye-bye. Thank, Thank you, goodbye. Thank you, goodbye. Thanks a lot. Sure, bye-bye. Thanks, bye. Do pobacznia. Do pobacznia. Okay, Vasily, I must have ticked up yet, so... No, more than 50 people were, you know, you see? That's great. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, Tisha, sir. Aroused interest to see and it, it, it discussion показала, что бачу таки был. Так что я дуже дякую тобі і думаю, що ми якраз це будем цю доповідь мати на конференції вже тоді. Ти покажемо то для учасників, бо нас з Америки приїдуть навіть до нас. Так. Так. Добре, дякую всім вітання передавай в стейт коледжі. Все найкраще. На все добре. Щасливенько. Будь здоров'я.